Matthew chapter 20. We are in this chapter that really Jesus is being portrayed and presented. He's not being portrayed. He is this. He's being presented clearly as our suffering servant Savior. We've seen this throughout this chapter. We see Jesus talking about how good God is and the laborers in the vineyard and often how selfish we are because we want to compare ourselves to other people. And essentially, Jesus is saying, Whether you came late to the party or if you've been here from the beginning, the gospel and salvation are available to everyone, everywhere. He says the first shall be last, the last shall be first. We're coming in together, right? We're coming in together. Praise God for that. And after that, in verses 17, 18, 19, was what we we talked about last week, what we preached on last week, what we studied together. Jesus tells his disciples for the third time, this is... What's going to happen when we go to Jerusalem? I'm going to die. This is how it's going to happen. And oh, by the way, I'm coming back to life. Okay? So we get this recap, and Jesus has has talked about that. If you if you missed last week, go listen to the sermon last week. You can you can check on that. All right. Well, these disciples who Jesus has pulled aside tenderly to have this conversation with, they're on the road, they're going up to Jerusalem. Um, over 3,500 feet of elevation that they're traveling over these five mile, over these 14 miles. Uh, they're literally going up, okay, from where they started. Um, and he has spent about three years with these men at this point. Three years of, of in, in a lot of ways, we could kind of describe this as he's literally discipling them. This is spiritual parenting that he's poured into these men's lives. If you're a parent in the room, what's something that, like, you, like, if you had to pick one thing, this is what I want imprinted, spoken, and, and shared, and, and I, this is the one thing my kid, but when they leave my house, if they get nothing else, they get this. We would talk about honesty. We would talk about integrity. We maybe talk about character. Hopefully, we're talking about faith in Jesus. We can't make them choose Jesus. But by God's grace, they can see us walking by faith and that we want to do everything we can to point them to Jesus. Amen? Well, Jesus has spent three years with these people. Listen, um, they, these 12, they've seen him perform miracles. They've seen him forgive sin. They've heard him teach with divine authority that other people, when they hear it, like no one has ever taught like this. They've heard him uh, they've seen him care for people. They've seen him feed thousands at once. They've, they've seen him be patient with them, even though they struggled to understand. They've seen him walk on water. And I would say maybe one, at least one of the main things that Jesus has wanted to imprint on his followers is this is what it's like to be great. This is what greatness looks like. We'll get into what he says here specifically about this. And, and throughout uh, Matthew at different places and continuing through this last week of Jesus' earthly ministry, we see the disciples, they are arguing about who's going to be greatest. And as this text begins, it ends with Jesus saying, I'm going to Jerusalem, I'm going to be beaten, I'm going to be scourged, I'm going to hang on a cross and die but I'm going to come back to life. And the disciples' first question, the next thing we see is, hey, my mommy wants to talk to you. My mommy, she's got something she wants to talk to you about. That's not very manly. Listen, parents, do you ever feel like that the main things you're trying to imprint on your kids, like, man, have I just failed completely? Did they get this? You ever feel that way? If they're sitting next to you, don't nod too hard. All right? And guess what? If our parents were here, they would probably be saying some of the same things about us. I can't wait till Randy's dad comes. I'm so excited about this. I'm so excited. No one deserves this more than you. All right, so it's going to be awesome. It's going to be great, right? But you know what? I think Jesus, Jesus is here with these disciples, and he's and they're talking to him about things, and and they still don't get it. Parents, be encouraged. (laughs) Even Jesus' followers had a tough time getting what he was giving them. Okay? Be encouraged, moms and dads. Future moms and dads, tuck this away. Tuck this away when you feel like a failure. Be encouraged. It's going to be okay. All right? 
So uh, let's look at what we're, uh, what we're kind of focusing on here today. This is part two of the suffering servant savior, right? Um, so let's get into our outline, if you're with me. Let's get into our outline. Jesus suffered through first, he suffered through their self-centeredness. His followers were so self-centered. Again, they've seen him do all these things, miracles, forgive sin, teaching, caring for people, feeding thousands at once. They've seen him be patient with people even when they didn't understand. They've seen him walk on water, but they've also seen him sleep outside most nights. The scripture, Jesus says, hey, foxes have holes, birds have nests, but the Son of Man doesn't even have a place to lay his head. They've seen him sleep outside most nights. They've heard him say what I just quoted to you. They've seen others attempt to stone him to death. They've heard people threaten him. They've seen him hungry because either they missed a meal or he was fasting and praying specifically. And they just heard him say he was going to die on a cross in Jerusalem, but then rise from the dead, which they just didn't pay attention, I guess, to that part. Okay? So it has to be said... You know, it's been said that timing is everything. If you are a young person, I want you to listen to me. You know the right and the wrong times to ask your parents for stuff, right? Okay? If Tennessee loses, my boys probably should not be going, hey, can we go do this? Because I'm going to be in a bad mood. Okay? Uh, yeah, no, right? I'm grumpy, right? So you're, you're going to, timing is everything. This is a bad time. For two grown men to leverage their mommy to get Jesus to do something for them. Bad timing. Not, I don't know that there's ever good timing for that. Like, hey, are you guys boys or men, right? Like, we're trying to raise men in our house. We're trying to raise men in this church. We don't want to raise grown boys. Amen? Okay, so this is bad timing. Now, listen, we are Baptists. We know how much we like our seat. Right? So, in a way, it's almost like we get part of this. Like, I really want to sit in my seat. But these two men, these disciples, are self centered and they're trying to ask Jesus for, hey, my mom wants to ask you something for us. All right? So, how are they self centered? Well, first, we see their selfish ambition. Their selfish ambition. They were about themselves. James and John. They wanted a position of power, authority, and prominence. Look at verses 20 and 21 again with me in Matthew chapter 20. It says, Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to him with her sons, and kneeling before him, she asked him for something. Another gospel says when she came up, she says, Jesus, I want you to give me whatever I ask for. <laughs> there's, some, there's some bad name it, claim it uh, doctrine right there. All right, I want you to just give me whatever I ask for. All right, look at verse 21. It says, and he said to her, what do you want? She said to him, say that these two sons of mine are to sit one on your right hand and one on your left in your kingdom. Now, let's just be honest. If he had said this, those two would have argued about which one of those seats they'd gotten. <laughs> I want to be on the right. No, I want to be. You know that they would have if you have more than one child. <laughs> right? You've, my mom, my mom is six feet tall. She says she's 5'11". She's six feet tall. She didn't want to be six feet tall for some reason. Anyway, most of my childhood, my mom drove a Honda Civic, which a six-foot-tall woman driving a Honda Civic is a challenge already. But here's the thing about that. It was, the, it was like a 1989 Honda Civic, right? And in this little hatchback, here's the thing about having a six-foot mom. She had long arms. She could reach us anywhere, <laughs> anywhere. And she was accurate right? She, was, she, could, she could get you, right? Well, guess what? Jesus' arm is not too short, and he sees what's going on here. He sees what's going on here. The disciples, they've already been corrected for arguing about who the greatest in Jesus' kingdom was going to be. So here's what they do. They start trying to chase authority, to chase power, to chase position the way the world does it. You know what they do here? They leverage their mom. Now, how, why, why would their mom have leverage? Well, if you actually study the scripture, James and John are Jesus' first cousins. Their mom and Mary were sisters. So basically, hey, 
your aunt wants to ask you something for us. That's what's happening here. That never happens in culture, right? There's no nepotism because of family connections ever in any kind of leadership, right? No, yes, there is. There's, there's often that. We see that so often. But listen, this is not how the people of God are called to do this. Listen, many marriages throughout history have been arranged because, hey, if my kid marries their kid, that'll help us here. Okay, how would you like that, young ladies? This, this twerp over here, but his dad's the king, and maybe he's going to be king one day. You marry him. He's weak, and he's soft, and he's limp wrist, but it's fine because it helps us. How would you like that? Let's arrange that. No. Okay? This is not how God's people move forward or upward. Listen, there's nothing wrong with desiring to climb in our world. There's nothing wrong with wanting to earn, to earn first place. There's nothing wrong... Uh, but there is something wrong with trying to manipulate your way to get it. There is something wrong with only wanting power and only wanting authority. Listen, people who came in the past and would ask, there are people who came in the past and would ask others at Waypoint. They are no longer here. They chose on their own volition to leave. We're, we're in this process. We're beginning some interviews over the next couple of weeks with people who've been nominated as an elder or a deacon. There are people, since I came here, there are pe- since I've been here in the four and a half years or so, there have been people who came after I got here, wanted power, wanted authority, wanted position, and they went to other people in the church and said, hey, you should nominate me for an, to be an elder. You should nominate me to be a deacon. Can I tell you something? Praise God the Lord has given us discernment because, get discernment because guess what? The person who is seeking power, seeking authority, is the last person who needs it. That's the last person who needs it. And by God's grace, he gave us some discernment in that. The elders said, you know what? Not, not right now. Let's, let's hold off on this. And they got mad because they didn't get to be in charge, and they left. I'm not celebrating that they left, but I am celebrating that they didn't get to take the world's standards and apply it into the church of the living God. This is not how the people of God behave, right? So Jesus suffered through their selfish ambition. Second, Jesus suffered through their sinful arrogance. They are arrogant. Um, our head football coach for the team Eli and Caleb play on, uh, for the, on the varsity, he, um, when parents sometimes complain about how their little boy isn't getting as much playing time as they want them to have, you know what they'll do? He'll, do? he'll just take his whistle and go, here, you want it? No one's taking him up on it yet. No one's taking it up on it. Because they don't want the responsibility, they just want... Listen, in the kingdom of God, football's not the kingdom of God, no matter how much we think it might be at times. That's stupid, Right? In the kingdom of God, the cross always precedes the crown. The cross always precedes the crown. We just all want the crown without the cross. Jesus said, yeah, you'll get these rewards if you suffer with me. We don't think, that's not like our American version of like following Jesus for some reason. We think like it should be simple, it should be easy, it should be gentle. That's not what following Jesus is about. Pay attention for more than five minutes and look beyond your neighborhood for just a second. I mean, look in your neighborhood, but look beyond it for a second. Following Jesus around the world is a dangerous endeavor. We t- all too often are closed mouth and step back into the shadows simply because we're afraid someone will say, well, they're kind of mean, they're kind of bad, because someone will say something about us. But we see these that are sinfully arrogant. Look what it says in verse 22, in the first part of verse 23. It says, Jesus answered, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I'm, I am to drink? Look at what they said to him. Yeah, yeah, we can drink it, yeah. They have no clue what they're talking about. Look at verse 24, the first part, or verse part, uh, 23, excuse me, first part of verse 23. He said to them, you will drink my cup. So what's he talking about here? All right, are we, we, is this, are we drinking now? What's happening? Okay, what's, what's he talking about? Okay, 
So, well, basically what he's saying here is this. I'm going to suffer. He just told him he's going to the cross. And he's saying, you think you can take, you're going to be able to do what I can do? Listen, what did Jesus do on the cross? You can answer. It's okay. He, he died, but why did he have to die on the cross? He took our punishment. He asked them, can you guys drink the cup I'm going to drink? And in their arrogance, yeah, yeah, we can do that. If you could do it, gee, we could do it. He tells them in verse 23, he's like, you know what? You are going to drink some of this cup. You're not drinking the whole cup that I drink. Because, listen, they're not paying for the sins of the world, but they suffer. James and John are the first and last disciples to die. Did you know that? Of the ones who, not Judas, but the ones who stayed with him. James is the first one to die. He's beheaded. He dies a quick death. John, they try to martyr him, I think, multiple times. At one point, they try to boil him alive, and he lives through it. They stick him on the island of Patmos for an extended time, and God gives him, in some ways, God gives him grace. In other ways, like, take me home, Jesus. This hurts, right? The first, and these two brothers, the first and last disciples to die. So in a sense, he says, yeah, you are going to drink my cup. In, in a way, you are going to suffer. And they don't have a clue. They're so arrogant. Yes, Jesus, we can, if you can do it, we can do it. Sinful arrogance. You know, sometimes arrogance will give us the wrong ambitions. It's, it's okay to have God-given goals and like, God, I want to I follow you. I want to serve you. But so often we have the wrong ambitions. And it's often because we are arrogant. Thirdly, Jesus suffered through their shared attitude. You love the alliteration this morning? Isn't that fun? All right, I'm proud of that. Look at verse, the last part of verse 23 and then verse 24, and then we'll get into point two. All right? It says this. Uh, we'll begin in verse 23. He said to them, you will drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those whom it has been prepared by my Father. Verse 24. And when the ten heard it, the other ten of the twelve disciples, and when the ten heard it, they were indignant to the two brothers. Now let's just be fast here. They are not indignant toward James and John because they're, they're not going, I can't believe you would ask something like that. That's the most selfish thing I could think to ask. That, that's not what they're saying. They're mad because they didn't ask first. That's what this means. All twelve of these guys had the same idea James and John just leveraged Aunt Salome to do it. That's what happened. I'm dead serious. That's exactly what happened. They're mad at James and John. can't believe you beat me to the punch. And your mom, that's not fair. Our mom's not, not his aunt. You brought, your mom, you brought Aunt Salome. Man, that's not fair. That, that's their perspective. And Jesus is suffering. You ever have a perspective like that that you just look back on and go, God... You should have just zapped me right then. I don't know why. <laughs> Thank you for your patience with me. But this is what's happening here. This is what's happening here. And look at verse 23 just one more time, and then we'll move on to point two. Just look at verse 23 real quick. He says, But to sit at my right hand and my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those whom it has been prepared by my Father. Can I just say this? If we will just trust the sovereign God of the universe with what's going to happen and how it's going to happen and if we will just trust him by obeying what we know we're supposed to obey he kind of tends to work the rest of it out doesn't he he kind of just tends to work the rest of it. and working the rest of it out might be you going to heaven earlier than you planned but where are you going thank you me and john Right? Let's go. So he suffered through this. Well, second, let's look at Jesus suffered as our servant. Jesus suffered as our servant. Two points here. First, let's talk about um, true greatness. He explains what true greatness is. Read verses 25 through 27 with me, and then we'll hit verse 28. But Jesus called to them and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. 
It shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Question, what is greatness? Like, what does it mean to be great? How, how would you define greatness? Here are some people's answer to that question. Some people throughout human history, here's some answers to this. Greatness is when people know your name. That's how, what one person said. Greatness is a lot of small things done well. That's better than the first definition. Here's another quote here. It says, you can only become great at the thing you're willing to sacrifice for. There's some truth to that. There's some truth to that, right? Another person said, greatness begins beyond your comfort zone. Don't we all have a comfort zone? It's like, this is where I'm comfortable, right? This person is saying true greatness begins beyond that. Another person said, to become great, you must be willing to do the things that others are not willing to do. That was Nick Saban. I don't, I don't like quoting Nick Saban, but that was, that was, that was good, Nick. <coughs> Another person said, most people define greatness through wealth and popularity and position in the corner office. But what I call everyday greatness comes from character and contribution. The last definition, it says this. It says everybody can be great because everybody can serve. I like that. Martin Luther King Jr. said that. He got that one right. Do you want to be great? It's okay to say yes. You, you should want to be great. Jesus is telling us how we can be great here. And when he says great, he's not saying great in a completely different way. Now, how you get there is different, but he's not saying great in a completely different way than he's describing the Gentiles' word great. It's just how you get there is different. See, when he's talking about great, he's talking about leadership, he's talking about responsibility, he's talking about authority, he's talking about blessing, he's talking about anything that, hey, that's great, that is a great thing, that's great. He's talking about that, but he's changing their perspective on how they become great, how they attain greatness is what he's talking about changing. The world's not great behavior in ways. Ready? The great by the world standards, becoming great by the world standards, in verse 25, it gives us two ways. Look at verse 25 with me. Look at verse 25. The world says, here's, here's the two main ways you become great. It's, Jesus says, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. This lord it over them, this is dominant dictatorship is what this is. So how do you get power? How do you get authority? Well, one way is you strong arm your way into it. By the world standards, all right, you just were stronger than these other people and you, you took it. Here's another way that greatness takes place. Look at the rest of that verse. How, how the lost people, how the world attains their greatness. It says, and the great ones exercise authority over them. What this is basically talking about this is charismatic control, one pastor said. Charismatic control. In other words, don't you see even in America, there being people who, let's flex our way into authority, let's flex our way into position, and if we've got to do more than just flex, okay, fine, let's do it. We'll kill who we have to kill, we'll do whatever we have to do. We'll take whatever we have to take, we'll change laws, we'll do whatever we have to do. Also, you see the other side of that, where you have the slick-tongued leadership. Man, they're smooth. They just sound, they just say all the right things, and they're a chameleon here, chameleon there. Whatever crowd they're around, they just, whatever sounds slick and smooth, that's, that's how we'll get leadership. That's how we'll get control. That's how we'll get, gain authority. That's how we'll take over in different ways. And Jesus says, this is how the world gains control. This is not how the people of God in the true kingdom achieve greatness. So we see the world's way, and then we see God's way. 
Look at verses 26 and 27. It's, he says, It shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant. That word servant. Great, in this first verse, talks about serving. This word servant is diakonos. That sounds like the word deacon, doesn't it? Because that's what it is. We transliterated that. We didn't have a word for it, so we just transliterated it. We've got deacon, okay? Now, this is not talking about the position of deacon. Sometimes people see this Greek word, and they want to say, well, every time we see this Greek word, it describes the position of deacon. We actually see women in the book of Acts serving, and it says they were serving, and it used the word, uses the word diakonos. It's like, okay, now we can have women deacons. Well, that doesn't jive with 1 Timothy. doesn't jive with any of the rest of the scriptures, right? Women aren't less than, but that's not one of the roles that's available to them, right? Otherwise, we're saying the disciples are deacons here, and no, they are not, okay? But it is 100% describing the type of service that is available to all of Jesus' followers. We should all serve, and that word deacon, it literally means to serve tables, to wait on tables. Some of you are going to lunch today, and you need to become the type of Christian that is more kind to your server than what you have been. Did you know this? Most servers despise working lunch on Sunday because all the Christians show up and about a third or half of them are really rude to their server. And that server is literally, they're doing it for pay, but they're literally serving your table. Jesus says here, if you want to be great, don't try to take over. Don't try to win by having smooth words. If you want to be great, serve. Serve in the roles that you might think are the most minor. Serve consistently. Serve faithfully. Serve. Be a servant. Jesus says that. And the next thing he says is not servant. In verse 27, he says, slave. Are you out there today? All right, look at what it says in verse 27. And whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Your doulos is the word here that's used. Your slave. Now listen, a person who serves tables gets paid at something. I mean, not much, right? Because we better tip, right? Isn't it funny how everybody is asking for a tip for everything now? It's like you did nothing. Like, why am I tipping you? No. And you feel guilty sometimes if you don't tip people who, like, you didn't do anything. You hit a button. That's what you did. Praise God for you. I'll tip somebody else. <laughs> right? Okay? But even a table waiter gets paid. Slave. The people of God are called to be great. And we're called to be great by serving. And the type of service that we give is this type of service. Look at me. We serve without mercenary motive. What does that mean? It means you serve, and it doesn't matter if anybody says thank you. We want to say thank you, but if we miss it, if we forget, you didn't do it for that anyway. We serve not expecting anything in return, just that we want to serve. That is how we become great in God's kingdom. So application, ready? Stop asking what's in it for you. What do I get out of this? I'm stacking chairs every Sunday after service. What do I get out of this? All these other people, they just take off and leave. They're going to lunch. It's fine. Well, I want to go to lunch too, though. I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about people who stack chairs. <laughs> Nobody said, thank you. Hey, man, I, I give a tithe every week. I give my offering. How come we didn't get the song I wanted to sing? That's 
That's not greatness. Church family, let's be great. And not just so we, just so we understand, Jesus didn't just give words to this. Here's our last, last point, ready? Jesus is also our great example. He's our great example of this. What does it say in verse 28? It says, for even, like Jesus says, even me. He said, even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. And how did he serve? And give his life as a ransom for many. Okay, church family, musicians are coming up. I want, I want to ask you a question. If Jesus can surrender his rights, what he deserves, why can't we? If Jesus can lay down his preferences, what did, I mean, what did Jesus pray in the Garden of Gethsemane? Are you with me? Are you, are you out there today? What did he pray in the Garden of Gethsemane? He said, okay, Father, if this cup could pass, if, it, if this could happen a different way, let's, can we do that? But nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. He is our great and faithful example of true service. Look at what this verse says. Just, just quickly. They're going to start padding back here. It'll feel more comfortable. He gave his life as a what? What's that word? A ransom for many. What's a ransom? What's a ransom? A ransom gets paid when someone is taken captive. When someone is captured. And we had been taken captive and captured by our sin. And we deserved the full wrath of God. The enemy had us in his clutches. And there was one way that we could be set free. And that only one way is if there was one who had no sin of his own would come and take our place. Well, guess what? One did. We should be shouting and screaming right now, just so you know. Like, this is, heaven's not going to be this quiet. Jesus had never, had known no sin. 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says, He who knew no sin became sin for us, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. The righteous, holy Savior took on your sin and took on my sin. And he hung naked on a cross after being beaten, after being tortured. He hung naked on a cross and gave his life as a ransom, not just for me. He gave it for you. 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 And he gave it for me. And if you're in this place today, you need to understand, number one, if you've never trusted Jesus, you have sinned against a holy God and you deserve God's punishment. But like we sang earlier about the love of God, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You couldn't earn it. You don't deserve it. But Jesus paid it. And he paid it in full. If you've never trusted Jesus, you need to understand, you've sinned against the holy God. You deserve punishment forever from him. But he offers you salvation through faith in Jesus. You can't be good enough. 
you can't get your way back. It's impossible. The bridge is broken. Jesus now is the way. Trust in Jesus. If you have trusted in Jesus, let's aim for greatness. You can't give your life as a ransom for many, but we can follow the example of Jesus that we would give our life to serve everyone we possibly can, to share the good news of Jesus with them as we're serving them so that they will also know the Jesus that we know. Listen, this Christianity is not about you. It's Jesus is for you, but this is not your story. You know that, right? Oh, let me share my story. It's not your story. He's the central character in this event, in this story. The fact that we get to breathe is a blessing and a gift from God. So don't waste your life. Don't waste your life thinking, well, what about me? Because that will never be satisfied. Give your life. Jesus gave his life as a ransom for many. Church family. Give your life. Give it to Jesus for salvation. Give it to the Lord in salvation. There are people in this room, God's calling you to, to ministry. He's calling you to, to formal, like elaborate, lifelong ministry. Maybe to pastor. Maybe as an overseas missionary. Maybe as a missionary right here in the United States. Because guess what? It's looking as bad here as it is a whole lot of places. There are lost people here. FYI, God called me to pastor, but you know that's a missionary, right? Hello? God's calling some of you out right now specifically for a role in ministry, and you have been afraid. Can I tell you, for months after God spoke to me about that, I told no one. I slept very little, though. And, but when I surrendered to what God was specifically calling me to, I had the peace of God because I wasn't disobeying anymore. Others of you, God's calling to ministry and what you might deem to be less, less formal ways, but are just as vital in the life of the church. Just as vital in the kingdom of God. Some of you, you know what you need to become? You need to become the minister that's the prayer warrior that God calls you to be. You may be looking at me and, and saying, Eric, Pastor Eric, I'm... I'm 80 years old. I can't, I can't do some of the things that I used to be able to do. Well, you know what you can do? You can do the most important thing. You can be a prayer warrior. You can be on your knees before God. Some of you, God's calling specifically to minister in our children's ministry. Some of you, God's calling specifically to minister in our student ministry. Some of you, God's calling you specifically to minister in different ways in the adult ministry. You don't exactly know how that, but you know you're supposed to be doing something. I'm supposed to serve. Some of you, God's calling to serve in ways that don't happen inside these walls on Sunday morning or Wednesday night. And guess what? That's still serving the Lord. Some of you, God's calling to, to be a minister where you work. Well, Eric, I might lose my job if I say the wrong thing or to the wrong person. You want to be great? You can honor the Lord and, and be wise about it. You can be, you can be a wise as, wise as serpents and gentle as doves. Didn't Jesus say that? I think he can handle your job. Some of you, God's calling to be ministers in your home. with your neighbor. I'm telling you right now, if you will commit and say, God, what my life, I hold in open hands. Whatever you put in my hands, by your grace, I will set my face and my feet to do. 
I'm telling you, we will equip you to do it. I'm telling you, if you will say, God, whatever you want me to do, I, this is a yes before you tell me what it is, God. Remember when we used to use checks? Some of you are like, what's a check? Don't worry about it. We know. This is a signed blank check, God. You write in the amount. You write in the recipient. This is a signed blank check. It's yours, God. I'm telling you, if you will come before the Lord and live your life that way, we will equip you and we will see God do amazing things. Or you could just sit there. Or you can sit there. We make time for what's important. Do you want to be great in the real kingdom? If you do, one of our elders will be down to your left. I'll be down to your right. You probably don't even need to come talk to us first. You probably need to come right here, get on your knees, on your face before God, and say, God, I'm in. I don't know what in means. I don't know exactly what that's going to look like, but I'm in. And by the grace of God, we will help you. What are you going to do?